Okay, so this is a graphics noob hour. All right, so uh, about me, which some of you probably know by now, but I've been using Linux since about 1994. Started using it so I could do some simulational physics. Right now I'm a computational chemist focusing on the glycosciences. Glycosciences is a fancy name for carbohydrate sciences. I manage Glycam Web, which is a website that is devoted to simplifying molecular modeling of carbohydrates. I do lots of stuff, hardware, programming, sysadmin, um, lots of DevOps at the moment. Hopefully that's going away soon. Uh, chemistry, molecular modeling, graphic design, user support, etc., etc. I know a little bit about a lot of things, uh, so you'll get to the end of my knowledge quickly if you are not careful. And all opinions are mine and not necessarily Frida's or UGA's. Goals today, learn relevant words, phrases, learn how to search the internet, be able to find relevant sections in the documentation, understand some basics of the technology, find software that you need, choose and convert file types. I appreciate all the breadth of options. There are many types of software for many applications available for Linux, and I will hopefully give you an overview of all of them. Questions are good at any time. Just start talking. I don't mind being interrupted. First term, WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Most of the popular graphic software is WYSIWYG software. And this is what you're probably used to seeing if you've used any document preparation software um, that I will not name, but there are LibreOffice versions of all of them. <coughs> anyway, whenever you type on the screen, what you see on the screen looks pretty much like what gets printed but most of your software isn't like that. So for example, I guess i show you real quick. I've got uh, somewhere. So if I'm on uh, some page here and I right click and I type view page source, I'm gonna see a whole bunch of code. And this is the code that makes the page that looks like this. So that is not WYSIWYG. You don't, what you see is not what you get. This code was probably generated on the fly by a computer somewhere, almost certainly not by a human. 99.17 or 18 nines after that, certain that a human did not make this page. Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, well, it's also that this page was created on the fly at the moment that I searched on this fa phrase. I'm pretty sure that Google doesn't have a cadre of people in the back um, entering these text terms into some HTML for me. Anyway, so uh, most software is WYSIWYG, but not all. And we will go back to the back to the slideshow. So I'm going to start from the current slide. Um, if you are an occasional graphics user, you probably want to use WYSIWYG. But if you use graphics a lot, you, there are more flexible options. You can automatically generate graphics, and you can process many files easily. And I will touch on those, although not go into them in any great detail. We'll touch on them a little later. So two other terms that are very important to the graphics, raster and vector. So this is an illustration of the difference between raster and vector. The bottom, the bitmap, is a raster. The top vector is a bit uh, is, is a vector uh, format. And you see that. As you blow up this little portion of this image, the vector looks really nice and the bitmap, bitmap doesn't. So I'll explain that in the next couple of slides. Raster. A bitmap is a raster type of graphics file. It's a big grid of pixels, each with a color. So for example, you've got this little image of a smiley face here, and it's been blown up so that you can see it pixelized. Pixelized is now a common term in American English, I believe. and Focused on here are these three boxes, these three specific pixels. And the first one has 93% uh, red, green, and blue. The middle one has 35% red, green, and blue. And then the, the, the third one has 98, 98, and 0%, which uh, if you mix red and green together, you get yellow. So anyway, that's, that's what a raster file is. It's just a big bunch of squares that have colors in them. That's it. Vector, on the other hand, is a file format that, dis that saves descriptions of shapes. That means that it scales infinitely. If your printer will get that big, you can make it however big you want. I recommend always using vector formats when possible because then you can make something as big or as small as you need without having to worry about pixels or having to worry about interpolating between two things. If you go to this address down at the bottom, you can try your first SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, file 
and scalable gra vector graphics SVG is a very common type of file format it is it is supported by most of the common browsers now so it looks kind of like uh, well this is some HTML with some SVG in it but you have a um, oops, sorry <coughs> You see in the SVG you have a width and a height, so that's the, the size of this box. I've cut off part of the box because it doesn't have much else in it. But there's a circle that um, has um, the center is 50 pixels over or 50% over and 50% high out of the 100%, I guess, of the size of the box. Um, the radius of the circle is 40. The stroke, stroke means the line. The line on the outside is green. The stroke on the outside has a width of 4, whatever 4 is, again it scales, so I can say pixels now, but it could scale to whatever, and the, fa the fill is yellow, and the, the circle is filled, and it has an outline in green, and this heading, my first SVG, that is HTML that you can see here. So SVG is something you can just write the file format. You can say I want a circle here, and I want it to have this color fill, and this color outside, <clears throat> and I want another circle here, or I want a rectangle or a square. And so SVG is a very, very useful file format. Are there any questions so far? Oh, okay. So there are many formats, uh, many, many file formats. Most of them are vector or raster or a combination of the two. Wikipedia has a page that just lists a bunch of file formats. Um, there are some other oddities. I thought I would print this, show this. This is uh, two, mo two molecules. It's the same molecule, two different views of it. Happens to be PDBID1UBQ. You can go to rcsb.org and download it for yourself. And I used Visual Molecular Dy Dynamics of EMD to make it. But anyway, this is a stereo image. And this is what chemists did before we had 3D graphics on computers. And the way you use this is you fuzzy up your eyes, you cross your eyes until the two images overlap each other. You kind of have to be right in front of it to make it work. And then you focus on the center image where there's overlap. And if you do that, you will get a 3D image and it takes a lot of practice. So if you're trying to do that right now, probably don't bother. It, it does take a little practice, but you can play with this at your leisure if you wish to download it and learn how to view molecules in stereo for 3D. Anyway, just and I did this with Linux, so just pointing you out that the, there's so much available for use with Linux, it's, you're really not limited. Um, uh, one style note, this is the only graphic style note that I'm going to point out, and this sort of reflects the vector graphics thing where I said, please, you, you, you probably want to use vector graphics. Design for the size of your image. Because, so consider this plot of a sine wave. This is just a plot of a sine wave nothing special, but if you start making this really, really small, the graphics just disappear. Those lines go away. Even at this size, you can no longer read the fonts. Make sure that you, you design your graphics for the size of your graphics because arbitrarily making them larger or smaller does not always work for the purpose of a human reading. A hardware note. Some graphics software integrates very tightly with your video card. If you think about it, graphics software sometimes needs to do some fancy stuff. And some of the software, like VMD that we use for our chemistry, it really speaks very directly to um, the, the graphics card. It doesn't go through the kernel as much as other software does. And so you can have trouble if you are using some of the really advanced software, especially if you have a brand new card. So if you've got a really, really, you know, newest, fastest, bestest card, you probably want to use the manufacturer drivers because the Linux drivers may not be able to keep up with a brand new card next year, no problem, but maybe not this year. Something Linux terminal server project, uh, we use this a lot at work. So we have one beefy fancy machine that does all of our rendering and it just pushes the graphics out to terminals. For that, we use virtual GL. Uh, anyway, there are other options, just pointing you out that if you have trouble with your fancy graphics, it could be that there's a communications issue with the card. All right, GNU Linux has graphics in spades. As I have already mentioned, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of programs that you can use to make all sorts of graphics. So today, I'm going to talk about two of them, Inkscape. Inkscape is the vector-based graphics generation program that is very popular. It uses SVG, the scalable vector graphics that you saw with the circle a second ago. That is its native format. And then I'll talk about GIMP. GIMP is GNU Image Manipulation Program. That's what GIMP stands for. 
it deals with raster graphics so its real superpower is manipulating existing photographs it can also do gener generate raster graphics but it's not really it's more for manipulating images and not so much for making them although you can make them there's something called penta that i learned about recently that seems to be more for paint type things you know painting raster graphics anyway uh, that will that will also be mentioned again later i will mention many other types of software at least just to give you an idea of what all is possible. Some of them are easy, some of them are advanced, and you'll have a chance to see all of this. Inkscape. Uh, HTTPS Inkscape.org, that's where to go to learn about Inkscape. Like I said, vector graphics, very powerful. There's a little bit of a learning curve, but well worth it, and there's loads of online documentation, and let's play with it now. So, here we go. Where did I put it? I've got, here's that's, nope, that's not Inkscape, hang on. Uh, so Inkscape is generally in, here you go, in your graphics menu. And if, and uh, it will open up here. Here's Inkscape. This is the outline of your page. It comes up usually with a letter or A4 page, depending on uh, its mood, I guess. Um, so anyway, I'm using the plus symbol to make it larger. You can change the size and shape of the page. If you wanted to do that, you go into File and then Document Properties. I'm not going to show that. Instead, I'm just going to show some stuff that Inkscape will do. One thing it will do is it will make you a square. And then if you sort of click, click on the, the fill down here in the left, there are other ways to do it, you can change things about that square. So for example, you can change the fill to uh, some other color and you can see the color is changing as I'm going. Uh, voila. So there, change color. I can change the stroke so I can make the, the stroke be a certain color. I can make the stroke be really large. So instead of one pixel, I can make it be uh, whoops, I can set number lock so that I can uh, do this. All right, now I made it 20 pixels and you can see that the stroke, the outline is a lot larger now. And now if I change the color, it becomes very obvious, right? So you can, you can do simple stuff like this. You can also make complicated shapes. So you can make a either a polygon or a star and you can change the number of corners that you want. Anyone have a number of corners they like? How about 19? Here's a 19-sided polygon that still has a really huge stroke, which is probably too big, because so now you can't see the polygon so well. Sorry. Turn the stroke size down to one pixel, and now you can see the 19 uh, points of the star. And now I'll show you something even weirder that uh, Inkscape can do. And this is spray. So I've got this 19-sided pointy object uh, selected. And so if I click on the spray can, now I can spray paint with that object. Right, so Inkscape has, you can do lots and lots and lots of stuff. So here's something else that you can do. I can, um, I can draw a curve. And it, there's a curve. I'm going to make the stroke paint something a little bit more visible. And now I'm going to put some text on the screen. It's going to say, hello world. And I'll even calculate my age because, because I just have to do these things. Anyway, click on hello world. And I'm going to click on that path and I believe that I will be able to uh, da, da, extensions I always have to go look this up generate from path pattern along path and I believe that if I say apply ah okay hang on one more thing I have to first convert this to a path so object path now now let's try that again. Uh, and now hello world is following the path 
that I drew just a second ago. And you can do that not just with text, but you can do that with images and all sorts. Okay, all right. So, Inkscape. Huh? Uh, yes. <laughs> there, there. That's this. <clears throat> No political statements. So uh, let's let's save this, and I'm going to save it just as their drawing one dot SVG is good. And so if I go into uh, where where do you think it might have saved drawing one dot SVG? Oh, there it is. All right. So if I open this up, um, if I open this up with something like oh I don't know, Vim Vim works. Um, I'll make this a little larger too. Hang on. I'll make, I'll make this vis visible shortly here. Uh, this terminal font, uh, 4G, yeah, that should be good. Okay, now it's much larger, but you can see that all this is is SVG. It's just a big scalable vector graphics file that contains lots of information about, oh, okay, the number of sides, 19-sided, image okay uh, SVG is a file that you can go in and edit so that means that if you don't like exactly what Inkscape did you could go in and edit the file and and that way you can just do that so anyhow uh, that's really all I plan to show about Inkscape but it does oh so much stuff it's really very powerful and anyone have any questions no no okay all right huh None that would take less than three hours, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't have, don't have three hours. Um, okay, so the next thing that I was going to show is, uh, let's see, hang on, going to show GIMP. I have the same thing to say about GIMP. Loads of online documentation. A little bit of a learning curve, but well worth it. And I have GIMP sort of up and ready to go here. I have a couple of files. One, this was provided by. Um, Sorry, hang on, wait, Tux will wait just a minute. This was provided by uh, Scott Long, who works with Bike Athens. And he says that uh, he uses Penta to do lettering because he says Penta is better with lettering than GIMP is. But he uses GIMP for the basic uh, image in the background, and then he used Penta for lettering. So I'm just passing that along. I've never used Penta, don't know anything about it, but apparently it's a good thing. But let's talk a little bit about... Um, about just playing GIMP. I'll do that with just this Tux image. I took a picture on my phone recently, a few minutes ago, a picture of a, a, a stuffed penguin. And so there are loads of things that you can do. So you can do color balance, all the things that you might do with a photograph. You can change the color graph, uh, the, the color balance uh, to make it look completely ridiculous or good depending on your your interests um, there are uh, filters you can uh, like you can here's an edge detect let's see if I say okay then it'll it takes it a minute oh, that, that, that. so you can just barely see the edge of tux there around on that um, you, I can also undo so let's see. If, oh man. Uh, that wasn't vectorizing. That was that. Yeah, that, that's a good question. That was not vectorizing. That was just what it did was it just goes through and pixel by pixel tries to figure out where the edges are and it draws little lines wherever it thinks there's an edge. And the line is is is, is raster too. It's also just a bunch of pixels. Uh, the, it is possible to vectorize and. Inkscape, I believe, is where you want to go to vectorize. Okay, so you would take a, an image like this, import it into Inkscape, and then vectorize it. And then there's also things like simplify, so you can take a bunch of little jagged things and it'll turn it into something a little smoother. I know Inkscape will do that. I'm not in any way uh, a. I'm, I'm just. I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not really that good at all of this. So let's see. Uh, apparently, you can make it look like Van Gogh. Uh, let's see. Which I'm not sure that that actually. Oh no! I don't know how long this will take to calculate. <laughs> well, we'll let it go for a minute. Uh, yeah. All right. Nope. Not gonna. Not gonna do Van Gogh. It was too hard. 
So let's see. Anyhow, you can do lots and lots and lots of things with it that make all sorts of, hmm, let's see. Uh, pixelize. Let's see. Let's try. Yeah, that's easier. Oh, no. That wasn't much of a pixelizing. Let's see. Let's do it. Let's try again. Uh, pixelize, but let's make it uh, 100. And yeah, there you go. Okay, so if you need to blur someone's face out or you just want a blurry picture, there's your pixelized picture. Let's see. One of the things that is really useful is let's say that you wanted to, um, one, one of the things that I end up doing a lot is what I call a, 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 it's, it's color to alpha. So let's see. Let, let's say that you wanted, oh, sorry. Oh, back here. I don't want that. I say you wanted everything white to be completely transparent so that you're going to put it in an image and everywhere there's white you're going to be so see something behind it like maybe a pink or some other color. What you can do is I can say uh, color color to alpha and this is going to choose the color white. You can choose any other color that you want to be your alpha color. Let's choose white. I'm going to say OK. And now everything that was white in this image has been replaced by this sort of grid. And let me show, let's see, where's my, oh, my layers is, hang on. Oh no, can I? So here's layers. I'm gonna make a, um, I'm gonna get a new layer and I'm gonna have the, the layer be, uh, let's see, the background color. Okay, there's there's a white layer. If I move it down, your picture looks just like it did before. Um, let's see, edit layer attributes. I wonder, no, that's not cancel. Let's see, let me make a different foreground color. So now I'm gonna make the foreground color sort of a reddish pinkish color there. And I'm going to make a new layer. And this one is going to be the foreground color, which I think is that sort of pinkish color. And now uh, you can see that everywhere where there was white, it's now this pinkish color, right? Um, so you, there's lots that you can do with transparency. You can also crop. You can, uh, oh, well, you can also, <laughs> these, the Inkscape, they're not the only ones that you can use to uh, draw. Uh, spray paint thing. So for example, let's see, which one of these is the spray paint one? Uh, not that one? No, let's see. Which one? Fuzzy select. No, fuzzy select. I want paintbrush. All right. So uh, I'm going to make the color be that, I think. And um, yeah. And let's see. I'm going to choose this. Oh, come on. What am I doing wrong? Brush, chalk, so. Why am I not working? Okay, I don't know how to do. Um, let's see. Hang on. Let's see. Yeah, brush. It is possible to paintbrush with it, and I should know totally how to do this, but I'm not doing it properly, so. Okay, anyway, you can draw stuff on GIMP. Uh, let's see, what else? Normally, I can do that when I'm not trying to. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I like, I, I always, I always do seem to get it if I'm, if I'm not actually, well, there's a, there's a, a nice round stroke or a, Anyway, so um, you can draw on top of your image. Any questions about GIMP? All right. Oh, all right. So, and we'll go back to this. I'll start here. Mm -hmm. So, if you're really into graphics, the 
beyond just uh, if, if what you want to do is draw a new picture every time then WYSIWYG is probably where you want to go but you can do a whole lot with graphics generating it automatically so this is non WYSIWYG so you're not going to be trying to um, see as you're producing the graphics what it looks like and Inkscape has a couple of options. One, of course, you can just write your own SVG file. SVG file is readable and writable by humans. You can just write it to have circles and squares and whatever it is that you want. But Inkscape itself essentially is a front end that makes SVG files. That's what the program really does. And so you can always use that just to generate something that you can then copy and change. But it also has some command line capabilities. Um, if you see dash dash verb at the link below, you will learn about the command line capabilities, which are somewhat limited for Inkscape. However, with GIMP, you have um, something called a batch mode. So for example, if you've got a hundred images and they all need the same photographic cor correction, same color balance, the same brightness or darkness or whatever, GIMP's batch mode will allow you to apply the same operation to all of those files. So you, you can you, so you can essentially script your um, batch mode. And at that link there, they, they've got an example of what they call script foo that they use for um, for for this purpose. Uh, if however, there are many other ones. Uh, oh yeah, actually, other easy graphics. Penta I talked about earlier that Scott says is good for uh, text, I believe in. Xfig is a really old vector graphics program that I use. But this predates Inkscape. It's a little bit easier and simpler than Inkscape, but it's also kind of different from what you might have seen. Of course, LibreOffice has in its draw and in its impress and writer and math, it has all sorts of options for making drawings and importing graphics. You can do a lot just in the Office software that comes with uh, Linux, including there's even a math part. They have a place for making equations. So lots of lots of things you can do. There's also a command called convert that's part of the image magic, and that's image magic one word with a K after the C on magic, so K at the end of image magic. Anyway, it's a it's a package that you can use among many other things. You can use the the command convert, and you can convert between formats. You've got an SVG and you need a PNG, you can use convert. You've got a PNG, you need a JPEG, you can use convert. There is, so it can be very useful for that, um, do that on the command line. All right, so now I'm going to get kind of uh, advanced and technical on you here. S text, there are some really good non-WYSIWYG text editors. And tech, that's Tau Epsilon, or Chi, the tech, so not text, but tech, and LaTeX, which sometimes is called LaTeX or something else. These are document um, markup languages, so uh, document processing languages. And there's a um, front end that's semi-WYSIWYG, not completely WYSIWYG, called Lix that you can use as a front end to LaTeX. LaTeX and formerly Tech, Tech, LaTeX is based on Tech, it's the sort of modern version. These are a beloved of the American Mathematical Society, so they indeed, down here where I say use package AMS Math, that is American Mathematical Society, Mathematics, so the American Mathematical Society uses this, this most of the scientific journals will accept LaTeX as your submission format because it just does a beautiful job of, um, of, of of processing especially equations but text in general so for example the equation that you see down at the bottom uh, which by the way graphs as a really cool sort of ring down looking thingy anyhow um, I, I come up with functional forms in my spare time whenever I have which is once every 10 years and this is one of the ones I found you should go graph it um, anyway it's um, <clears throat> this equation was formatted using the text that you see above here, and so it's you know y equals backslash line, sign uh, big right open left or parenthesis and 12x plus 30 times and make the e a Roman because it's not a, just an e it's a, the exponential you know number and uh, going to to the power of x and then I'm going to multiply all of that by the stuff over here in parentheses e again to the negative x. Uh, pi x squared plus e x and again this e is the same as that one sort of a fancy equation but the point is that you can format things beautifully using tech and latex that you cannot necessarily do in other ways 
graphs in the math sense of the term graph. GNU plot is very versatile and very powerful. So for this thing on, on the right here, I want you to look very carefully and depending on your knowledge of geography, you might realize that this is tracing the outline of France. And indeed, all of the f cities are sized by the size of the city in France. This is a graph that was plotted by GNU plot. It's so it is an incredibly, incredibly powerful program uh, that I, I use a lot. And here are two um, Tori that are uh, intersecting and you've got some um, some transparency so you see through the one into the other and uh, the these uh, links here show you how to get to the, the demos, the, the example text for how to create these graphs and these demos all come with Newplot if you download load Newplot you get all of the examples and you can recreate them from scratch and copious uh, documentation online because lots and lots of people use Newplot. So uh, questions about anything thus far? Yep, yay. All right, and this is the computer science version of graphs. So in computer science a graph is, so you probably have thought of graphs as having points and lines. You use points and you connect the lines using, uh, li connect the points, sorry, using lines. In the computer science world, a graph is a series of nodes, which are kind of like points, and edges, which are kind of like lines. So there's a node called start, and it is connected by an edge to a node called A0, etc. And you can use these to, uh, for th this one on the left is a directed graph, so the, when I say directed, each of the edges has a uh, direction, so this is an arrow. You can use this to um, graph workflows of, of of course programs and stuff like that. Um, it, it's used for lots of really really fancy theoretical stuff but also some fun stuff and here's a, one of the fun ones on the right. This is linked from the GraphViz people. This, uh, if you go to this gallery you can learn a whole lot more about it but these are um, sparse matrices, incredibly large and sparse matrices that are being represented by uh, graphs that were made uh, presumably by graphs viz. so these are just you know enormous graphs with you know zillions that would be the technical term of uh, nodes connected by edges and the edges in this graph are colored by the length of the edge so the I think the sh I don't remember which way it goes shorter is called longer <coughs> can't remember one of them is one direction is red and the other direction is blue and I don't remember which is which, but you can go and look it up. Uh, let's see, molecular modeling. There are a number of molecular modeling packages and they all have slightly different uh, fortes. VMD, Visual Molecular Dynamics. I use this a lot because it is tuned for trajectories for um, like long videos of molecular motions. That's VMD is really good at. Chimera is good if, if you just want to make really beautiful pictures, Chimera is really nice at that, not, so, not as tuned for trajectories. PyMol is pretty easy for people to use as it's JMol, so a lot of people who are just using molecular graphics in a sort of, uh, you know, not a everyday dedicated. Uh, it, it, yeah, yes, Pi, the Pi is the Pi of Python, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and J is uh, JavaScript, J or, okay, yeah, or Java, 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 uh, there's a JS mole that's JavaScript, I think JMOL is Java. Anyhow, by the way, the thing that I'm showing, <laughs> excuse me, the, uh, the image that I'm showing here is the green and the yellow, those are two identical copies. This is a dimer of something called Rantes, R-A-N-T-E-S, all capital, or CCL5. Those are different, different names for it. This is a molecule that helps to direct um, helps to tell other molecules in your body where to go. S for example, if you cut yourself, it would tell the white blood cells, hey, over here. That's part of its job, um, this particular molecule. And the, the magenta looking thing, this is um, a little fragment of heparin, which is uh, another sort of uh, biological molecule used in signaling. And indeed, the heparin and the rantes work together, but you can see the heparin is, is complexed to the rantes, it sort of sticks on at the shoulders here, and uh, 
uh, heparin is a carbohydrate and that's the reason that I have a picture of this because I do modeling of carbohydrates and this was actually one of our students not me but I used her uh, molecules very happily to make pretty pictures and now to show you so the next slide you're going to see that picture again and the reason is that ray tracing you may not think much of normally but I do sometime there are lots of ways to do ray tracing in Linux. Tachyon and Pavre are probably two of the better known, but there may be others. What ray tracing does is it takes um, objects that are sort of drawn in its 3D head and it sets a light source. Excuse me. It sets a light source and it the software imagines light coming from the source and hitting the objects and bouncing off of the objects and then toward your eye and that's how it makes this image so it, this image was actually made by having all the atoms of these these molecules um, represented in 3D space and then it set up a light like one over here and one over here and one sort of down there and then it traced all the rays of light hitting those bits of the molecule and then coming toward you and, and that's how it made this flat 2D image. But you can use ray tracing for lots of other things. If you've seen any computer generated graphics, almost certainly there was ray tracing involved because that was how they managed to get things to move around and have it look realistic. Uh, video editing, not something I, I know a lot about. I do know that it exists and that there are lots of types of software for it. This is a recent, um, uh, article I found on the web is from the FOSS, it's FOSS people. I'm not sure if they are uh, endorsed by other FOSS people or not, but that's free and open software. It's, that's free and open source software, software. That's what FOSS stands for. Here are their five favorites as of January 2017. Blender was apparently used for Spider-Man, so apparently is used at least in some actual Hollywood films. Um, so anyway, there are lots of options there. Uh, languages, there are languages that are tuned for graphics. Scalable Vector Graphics, SVG, that I showed you earlier is one of them. There are others. TCL, I know about TCL because it is the language of VMD. VMD was used to make this image that you're looking at, Visual Molecular Dynamics. Anyway, it uses the language TCL and you can write your own little TCL widgets and import them into the VMD. You can have, you can have, if you made a little 3D tux, you could have your little 3D tux sit in the, the, the valley there between the two ranties or, or whatever you might want to do. Um, TCL would allow you to do things like that. Um, let's see. Yeah, so that was, that was my sort of tour of graphics and Linux. I, I promise there's lots and lots and lots that you can do with Linux that has to do with graphics and I know there are lots of other applications and areas that I don't even know about but anyway are there questions or do you want to go look at something more or check out some software or search something on the web just say and we can do it doing good okay how is time oh uh, yeah well we still have 20 minutes what about uh, computer science do you think Okay, yeah, so if you have an image, so you're saying you have images that are just really too big to load up. In that case, you, you, you either need a better graphics card, more RAM, more memory on your computer, or a smaller image. And if you wanted to make your image smaller, the convert, the command line convert, you can use it to resize your image down to like 50%. Uh, actually, that's one of the... It's one of the examples. Uh, so let's see, hang on. Uh, convert examples. So um, blah, 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 blah. No, nope, not that one, not that one. That looks like it might be it. Um, so yeah, okay, here you go. Um, so that is the line that we're looking at here. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, there we go. So that's probably more visible now. So it's talking about this image right here. On the command line, you enter convert your file name dot whatever it is, dash resize to the size you want and the output file name that you want. 
and so convert's probably the most lightweight way to do it because image magic has to load everything into graphics that you can then interact with right so converts kind of probably be one of the lighter weight ways to get your image down to a usable size. Is that what you were at? Oh, yay. Okay. Cool. Um, other? And, and GIMP also can do these sorts of things. Sometimes Inkscape does better converting to raster, and sometimes GIMP does better converting to raster, and sometimes Convert seems to do better. And I think they're all really related to each other. I'm not sure why, but it does. You know, sometimes you want to play around, see which one does the best job. Other, other questions? No. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So if you're going to publish, first off, every journal has a, its own requirements. So you got to go look at the requirements for the journal. Um, you, most of them, except TIFF or JPEG or PNG, and some of them will take SVG or will take uh, encapsulated postscript, which I didn't talk about, but that's a really old um, vector format for also for text processing um, or for text. Um, it was, I think, actually a printer language to begin with. Anyway, um, you want to look up the requirements of the journal, but yeah, any of these can make you that image. I do recommend you start in a vector format because if you can start in the vector format, then it's easy to get something like GIMP or a convert or whatever to make you a really high resolution because a lot of times the journals want like 1200 dots per inch or, or something or maybe not 1200 but yeah, 600 they want you know really really high resolution images and and so you don't necessarily want to work with that really huge image as you're just sort of day to day doing stuff get it to look right on your computer in a vector image and then save it at whatever size you, your journal wants that usually works really well. Anything else? Yeah, I have, and of course I've learned all of this stuff from exactly that sort of thing, having to figure out how to get an image to look pretty for a journal or, or whatever. Yeah, yep. All right. Victor? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and once you get good at it, then someone changes the software because, you know, you couldn't just get too easy. Right, right. Anyway, yeah, yeah, that happens. It's all right, though. Get new stuff available. So, anything else? Any other? No? All right, yippee. Then I will uh, close this, and we'll see if uh, Charlie is able to handle the, the audio.